Hello, I'm Michael Goldhaber, IBA U.S. Correspondent. Uh, today, I'm, I have the honor of speaking with Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Philip, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Michael. When you presented the findings of your U.S. country visit, uh, then U.S. Ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, scoffed. It is patently ridiculous for the United Nations to examine poverty in America. So tell us, why is she wrong? Well, uh, if 40 million people living in poverty uh, is not a human rights issue and is not something that some sort of external scrutiny should be focused on, uh, I'm not sure what is. Uh, I guess that every country thinks that its own human rights record is fine and that we, the UN, should be focusing elsewhere. Uh, but it's clear that the United States has a blind spot on a lot of these issues, and I think it's very important for the international community to shine in the spotlight on the extent of poverty in the U.S. and the implications that has for the enjoyment, particularly, of civil and political rights in this country. You said in your report that there was a, a sharp contrast between uh, the attitude of U.S. officials and, and uh, those in some of the other nations you visited. Have you found that um, officials are, are more committed to addressing the problems instead of denying them, or is denial a, a universal uh, condition? The U.S. is different in the sense that it doesn't recognize what we call social rights. So it doesn't accept that there is a right to health care, for example, uh, let alone a right to housing. In other countries, at least in Western Europe, that's taken for granted. The levels can be debated and so on, but there's no question the government must ensure that its citizens have those basic levels. In terms of reaction to critical reports, I think that's more of a universal phenomenon that no government wants to be criticised they're going to try to discredit it in some way. But that's not the key issue. The key issue then is what does the government really do about it? And where there's goodwill, governments will, having said we don't like the report, will then start trying to address the key issues. Where there is no political will, they will simply dismiss it and move on. American exceptionalism is <laughs> taken as an article of faith uh, in this country. So in, in what ways positive or negative, did you find us to be exceptional? The United States is clearly exceptional in terms of its social welfare programs. They are very um, intermittent, uh, deliberately inadequate, premised on sort of libertarian assumptions. Uh, I think that certainly makes it different from most other developed countries. Um, America is exceptional in the sense that there's a real openness to public debate. Uh, there's a really vibrant civil society. There were lots of groups that were very keen to engage. There's a Congress which has quite a few members who were fully engaged with my reporting, who made an issue of it afterwards and so on. So I think the United States has both good and bad aspects of exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. You talked about the, uh, our country having an ethos that the rich and poor deserve what they have, uh, that the poor are, are takers and scammers. Uh, and you also talked about the American dream turning into the American illusion. Well, I think the conservatives over the last 40 years or so have really hammered this view that anyone who is on welfare is basically doing it unnecessarily and has made themselves intentionally a burden on the state. So we're encouraged to see that anyone who's getting welfare really could be out working instead. So no account is taken of all of the things that befall average people in terms of medical uh, bad health, in terms of mental health challenges, in terms of what happens to their kids, in terms of car and industrial accidents and so on. Lots of people are simply unable to work and need to get decent support. That's not factored into the US mentality when we think of welfare. In terms of social mobility, uh, the great American dream, uh, which people still believe in very firmly, the sad reality statistically is that the United States is less mobile uh, 
than almost any other developed country. You've got a better chance in countries like even the United Kingdom, which used to be very um, hidebound or whatever, uh, of being able to move from one low income group to a much higher one through your own effort than you do in the United States. In its uh, official response to the UN, uh, the Trump administration offered some very different statistics from yours. Uh, they made the, the claim, which uh, demographers uh, called a joke, that only 250,000 Americans are in extreme poverty. What do you regard as the most meaningful measures of poverty in the U.S.? Well, uh, one can debate that endlessly, but to suddenly say that, no, the figure of 40 million is wrong and it really should be replaced by something like 300,000 is ludicrous. One can always do this on the basis of statistics, but it's also important just to look around you, open your eyes. We know the sort of poverty that exists in most of the large cities that, uh, in the United States. Uh, we know the extent of rural poverty in areas from which employment opportunities have disappeared. Uh, there just is a huge amount of poverty that's not really being addressed. And when you meet the people who are living in those conditions, they don't have access to dental care, for example, nothing. Uh, if they get into acute pain, they can go to, to an emergency room which might extract a tooth. Um, they don't have access to a doctor except in a dire emergency. Um, it makes it much harder to get work. Um, their kids are very badly off getting low quality education and so on. So to say that there isn't any real poverty in the United States is not to look around the country. You write about uh, the U.S. leading the OECD in infant mortality, youth poverty, obesity, incarceration rate, second to last in sanitation. And perhaps most striking is that the U.S. now leads its peer nations in inequality. Just at the end of my visit to the U.S., uh, the World Health Organization announced that China had actually overtaken the United States in terms of healthy life expectancy mm. for a child born today. Mm. Now, child, uh, China is still a very uneven country. It might be rich in global terms, but per capita it's way below the United States. And for it to have a better healthy life expectancy is truly shocking. Skid Row um, was an amazing experience because you are right in the shadow of a thriving and prosperous central business district. And within a few hundred yards, uh, you can see the other side of life as it were. But suddenly in Skid Row, you've got cities of tents, you've got uh, toilets provided uh, at a ratio that wouldn't be acceptable in a refugee camp in Syria, um, leading, of course, to people uh, urinating, defecating on the streets. Which is in turn criminalized. Yes, that's part of the uh, perversity of it all, uh, that the rather than trying to come up with longer term solutions, uh, the LA police were issuing citations and eventually arresting people at higher rates than they had been for a long time. The poor have no serious access to the legal system in the United States, despite all of the rhetoric. Uh, public defenders are hugely overworked, hugely underpaid, uh, the sort of services that the poor can get are very grim. Uh, they simply can't really expect to get a decent deal from the courts. You spoke about uh, the, the many millions of um, disenfranchised felons, uh, which is also a part of a pattern that you talked about in the criminal justice system. I think what's happened is the um, very determined effort to make people pay for their own access to justice, uh, which is fine for me. Mm. I'm quite well off. If I'm fined, if I've got to pay for a night in prison, I can do it. It'll have no impact on me. Mm -hmm. If you take a low income person, those fines can just put them out of the game for years. Uh, they have to pay their probation officer they have to pay to spend nights in county jails. Uh, they have to pay uh, 
uh, high bail uh, amounts. Uh, there's endless ways in which the criminal justice system is now being set up to really penalise the poor uh, and ensure that their future is much grimmer than their past has been. Or as, as you put it, to criminalise poverty, mm. to uh, lead to a, a cycle of homelessness, unemployment, uh, imprisonment, disenfranchisement. And, and the irony is that Nikki Haley said at one stage, we have never criminalised poverty. There is no law in this country that criminalises poverty. And of course, that's such a formalistic reading of it because there isn't a law that says if you're poor, you should be put in prison. Yeah. But there are all these other laws which are designed to benefit the well-off and to punish the poor. You, you wrote about the link between the decline of political rights and the decline of social and economic rights, uh, especially for minority groups. Would they be so deprived of basic services if they were not also effectively deprived of the vote? I think it makes a big difference. I mean, I, I quote in the report a senior Democratic uh, politician who said to me, you show me one of my colleagues who is really reaching out to try to get the votes of the poor. I don't think there's any of them because they don't think these guys are either going to be able or be willing to vote. So they're not part of the political priority. Uh, the extent to which there's been what I call overt and covert disenfranchisement uh, is really quite staggering for a country that prides itself on being one of the original democracies and really having a thriving democratic culture. That's increasingly less true because of all the steps that have been taken to exclude millions and millions of voters. So a lot has happened since your uh, official tour. The, the tour was in December 2017. The report was in June 2018. What new developments do you find the most discouraging? I think, I mean, <clears throat> the enormous storm cloud that hovers over the United States, which we all know about, uh, are the consequences of the gigantic tax cut that took place at the time of my visit. The president is now talking about further tax cuts while uh, anyone who's looking at the state of the economy says this is all completely unsustainable. There's going to need to be major cuts or major increases in taxes. We know that the agenda is to set the stage for saying we can't afford the welfare system we have. So the next step will certainly be an even more concerted effort, not just by the president, which has taken place for the last two or three years anyway, but soon by the Republicans in Congress who have been relatively quiet on a lot of these issues, but will now, having secured all of the massive, massive tax cuts, start saying we have no choice but to cut back on uh, whether it's Medicare, whether it's Medicaid, whether it's food stamps, we just have to cut radically. And that's going to lead to much greater poverty in the country. You will allude to the plight of the middle class in your recommendation. Is middle class insecurity a human rights issue that deserves more attention? If we look at the rise of populism around the world, a lot of people would say that that is linked to basic economic insecurity on the part of those who are not living in poverty, but those who are at risk, as it were. So the statistic that something like 40% of Americans couldn't afford a $400 emergency expense uh, without plunging into poverty or without having to take out a loan that they can't afford indicates that there's a large percentage of people who are living on the edge. I think if you take a holistic view, what a society should be doing is providing a basic but assured safety net so if people do fall through the net, there really will be a full range of different forms of assistance to help them to get back on their feet. And that's just not the case in the United States. And of course, we've seen the Trump administration each year proposing uh, drastic cuts that the Congress hasn't so far accepted. But food stamps are being cut back. Uh, Medicare eligibility is being made more difficult. And what does exist of a social safety net is being chipped away at at a pretty significant rate. You've written uh, soon after President Trump's inauguration, 
uh, about the challenge posed to human rights by uh, his distinct approach to governance, um, which uh, I guess you, you you say you suggested combines elements of unilateralism and deregulation with inequality and uh, a, perhaps a drift toward authoritarianism. Um, what are the human rights implications of, of that uh, perhaps toxic mix? Well, there's both the domestic and the international, of course. Uh, international, which is of the least importance to the American people, perhaps, uh, is an assault on the UN, an assault on multilateralism, a refusal to cooperate with other states, a refusal to take up a lot of the most pressing human rights issues unless they fit a very narrow ideological uh, position as with Iran or Venezuela or a couple of other countries. Uh, domestically, I think what we've seen is a pretty dramatic move away from the various uh, protections against discrimination that exist in the country. We've seen a downgrading of a lot of the institutions that were set up to try to keep a check on ensuring respect for people's rights. Um, and a lot of the other steps that have been taken, which the average person mightn't think of as a human rights step, for example, a lot of the deregulation, removing regulations against uh, use of toxic chemicals, against environmental pollution, um, and various other things are clearly an assault on the rights of the poor. It's staggering to be in Puerto Rico, for example, in some of the poor areas and see these giant mountains of coal ash right there, uh, completely unprotected, just waiting for the next strong wind to come and blow them around the neighborhood uh, and for people to be breathing them in. What events since your official visit do you find hardening? This is a self-centered comment, perhaps, but the degree of attention that the report got, it got very extensive media coverage. It's been taken up by a lot of civil society groups and so on. I think there is a growing awareness of the fact that existing poverty levels not only are not acceptable in their own right, but more importantly, that they have serious human rights implications. So even if you don't care about the economics of it, if you just care about the civil rights dimension of the United States, then poverty has to be addressed. If you look at the agenda of the Democratic presidential hopefuls, uh, it's remarkable how much uh, it tracks the rest of your policy recommendations. Uh, the month after your report, California actually took your first recommendation and uh, ended cash bail. How encouraged are you by these ideas? Uh, I think it is very encouraging when I mean, there are two things that are going on that I see. One is actually just a return to a long-standing American concern with the poor, whether we go back to FDR's New Deal, whether to LBJ's um, grand assault on poverty. Uh, this is not a new set of issues in the United States. It's just that the country has lost sight of them over the last 30 years or so. The second thing that's going on is not just a, what some would see as a, a great revival of the left, but is the realization even from the right that in fact, a lot of these initiatives would be economically productive. So you've got the International Monetary Fund, for example, coming out and saying, uh, extreme inequality is very bad for growth. Uh, it's not sustainable. Uh, it really is not the best economic move. So a lot of these programs that you mentioned, I think can actually be justified purely in terms of increasing productivity, um, putting every, giving every kid a decent education, providing more preschool care. That's purely an economic investment in a smarter society, uh, one that's able to have higher quality jobs uh, and more employment. Uh, health care can be seen in the same terms. The costs of not having health care are huge. It's all shoveled off to the police to do emergency stuff and then to the emergency rooms of hospitals. And the costs are infinitely greater uh, in those settings than they would be if people were getting regular preventive care from some sort of national scheme. So I find the current debate very encouraging.
but I think it's important for conservatives to also see uh, that there's a lot in this just in terms of, to use the awful phrase, making America great again. Is it possible that we will someday look back and say that the Trump era will be remembered for bringing social democracy back to America? Uh, well, I think it's certainly provoking a lot of thought and the realize uh, and a lot less complacency. Uh, I think democracies around the world have been highly complacent. We've got the world's best system, everything's working well and so on. Uh, the current experience has made it clear that a lot of institutions are not working, uh, that there's too much opportunity to skew things in favor of the very wealthy, uh, and that that's not in the interests of the overall society. So what might have been seen even five years ago as, no, no, that, that would be a socialist move, is now increasingly being seen, no, that would be in the interests of the broader community. And I think that is a potential silver lining in what we're currently going through. Philip, uh, I'd like to thank you on the IBA's behalf. Thanks, Michael.